Okay, so uh, so it is my uh, great pleasure to uh, to introduce uh, Jonathan Simon uh, from University of Chicago. Um, he uh, did his PhD with uh, Vladan Vuletic at MIT, working on the idea of uh, of making photons interact. So, so um, as you might recall, the photons actually uh, actually don't interact all that much, unless you come up with a very clever ways uh, uh, through uh, through uh, the mediation of atoms. Um, so, uh, so, uh, so basically. Um, um, that was his PhD work, and he he uh, he uh, then uh, worked with uh, Markus Greiner on uh, uh, quantum gas microscopes, which is uh, which is a uh, really an, an amazing platform, uh, different from uh, from uh, photonic uh, uh, platforms, uh, to uh, to use atomic tools to uh, study many body physics, and. Um, uh, he, since he's been uh, at the University of Chicago building his own group, he has actually won a much, uh, 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 went much beyond that um, to not only make photons interact, uh, but also making them behave in a topological fashion and also uh, studying inter uh, interesting uh, topological physics uh, with interactions. So this is this is actually uh, uh, this is actually the uh, 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 part of the uh, uh, topic that uh, he's going to tell us about in today's colloquium, uh, which uh, which I'm very excited about. And he has won many awards, such as the uh, uh, early investi investigator awards from Air Force, DOE, DARPA, etc. So uh, so uh, without further. Um, Without further ado, uh, let's uh, let's uh, uh, hear uh, what uh, John uh, will tell us about interacting photons and their topological behaviors. Um, Thank right. you very much for the uh, for the kind introduction, Jihang. Um, I, uh, I I I can't promise to be able to live up to it, but I will uh, absolutely uh, do my best uh, to do so. Um, it's really a pleasure to be here. I wish I could be there in person. Uh, and uh, be able to uh, chat with all of you individually. I have to say the best part about giving colloquia is uh, chatting with students and faculty uh, and hearing everybody's creative ideas. Uh, today, I had the pleasure of uh, chatting with one of Jihang's students, and that was really fun. But uh, you know, it's not the same doing these things remotely. But I hope that nonetheless, I can uh, share some uh, some of some stimulating ideas. Uh, with all of you uh, in the next, uh, what is it, two and a half hours I have? I love, my favorite thing is to say that and I get to see everyone's face, everyone looks up all at once when I say that. Uh, I think I'm going to start recording uh, what all the faces look like. Uh, yeah, in the next like uh, 45 minutes. So um, I'm going to tell you about uh, making matter out of light, uh, topological or otherwise. Um, and so uh, I think we need to start by just spending a minute uh, discussing the rules of the game. So what is a material uh, in this language? Uh, to me, a material is any collection of particles that interact with one another and thereby sort of organize or order. So what I've got drawn here is a bunch of little point particles that attract one another when they're far apart and repel each other as they get close together, and I've added just a little bit of friction. So you should take a second or two here to think about what's going to happen when I run this numerical model. Do you have your guess in mind? You run the model, and of course what you get is a crystal, right? Uh, you get the uh, you know hexagonal lattice symmetry. You can see the crystal has phonons. Uh, you can see order, you can see dislocations and other kinds of defects. Uh, you can see all of the physics that we think of for uh, sort of classical materials. And all we needed to do was have three ingredients, individual particles that have some kind of a non-trivial dispersion relation. We need interactions between those particles and some way to suck excess energy out of the system. Okay, and so what we're going to talk about in some ways today is how to realize these ingredients for ma matter made of light. Um, and what I hope is that this will give us some intuition uh, about 
you know, what it really takes to make a material because engineering each of these ingredients is a little bit tricky for light. Uh, and we'll hopefully also see that uh, working with light rather than uh, normal, uh, you know, baryonic matter, if you prefer, uh, gives us some unique advantages. So uh, the first challenge is that forces don't slow photons down. If I have a massive particle, like this black dot uh, on the left here, and it's moving to the right, but I apply a force to the left on it, it slows down and then turns around and moves back to the left. Great. What happens if I do that to a photon that's moving to the right? If I apply a force to the left, it changes color. Literally, that's what happens. It doesn't slow down, its color changes. So that's interesting, right? But if we're gonna make a material out of these particles, that's not very useful. So why does this happen? It happens because the energy momentum dispersion of light is linear, right? And so what that means is when I apply a force to a photon, I will change its momentum, but its group velocity is the slope of this curve, which is the same all along the curve. And so what that means is that the photon doesn't slow down. So our solution is gonna be to trap our photons inside of a material structure that uh, changes the dispersion relation of the light. And this effectively makes the photons act like massive particles. As we apply forces, they, uh, their momentum changes. And because the slope of the dispersion curve depends on the momentum, their velocity changes. Great, so that's challenge number one. Challenge number two, uh, Jihang kind of gave away a little bit. Um, but I don't begrudge him that because I think it's uh, in some ways, at least to me, the, the most difficult uh, thing that, uh, that we've had to contend with uh, and that's recently become possible to deal with with light. And this is that if I have two electrons and I bring them towards each other, when they get close together, they collide, right? I have some interaction potential between them. But what we know for light is if I have a wave packet moving to the right, that's a solution of Maxwell's equation, and I have a wave packet moving to the left, which is a solution of Maxwell's equation. Well, the sum of those two is also a solution to Maxwell's equation. So these wave packets just go straight through each other, right? And so what this means is that these photons kind of don't interact and that's bad news uh, for making materials out of light. So what's our solution to this? Well, how do electrons uh, interact with each other? Uh, I know uh, NYU is famous for its particle physics group uh, particularly. And so I'll, I'll just use a sort of particle physics analogy here. The point is that electrons interact with one another by exchanging a virtual photon. So maybe we can just turn this diagram around and have photons interact by exchanging a virtual electron. Well, that process is disallowed by pretty much every conservation law there is. Um, but we can write up higher order Feynman diagram that's not disallowed. This is small, but it exists. And basically building on that idea of using matter to mediate interactions between photons is going to allow us to make matter out of light, okay? So the analogy that we're gonna take today uh, builds on the way we understand solid state matter. So the point is in the solid state, we have electrons that interact with one another through a Coulomb potential, okay? And uh, they're, mass is modified by the existence of uh, a lattice of ions that creates a band structure, okay? Um, and so what we're gonna do is study this kind of idea with photons interacting uh, in a band structure either generated by optical fabry perot cavities or by uh, arrays of microwave resonators. And the key requirement is gonna be that uh, these tools have to be compatible with the strong interactions uh, that we're going to mediate between the photons in the sense that they can't have a lot of loss because uh, any interaction that we generate in, will be relatively weak. And so if the loss of the material is too large, we won't be able to get collisions before the photons are lost. So um, this is the end of the introductory section of this story. Uh, I do like to have little breaks in the midst of the talk. So if people have questions on these ideas before we move forward, uh, maybe we can, uh, maybe I can address them now. I cannot see the chat window, however. So, uh, you know, just yell out your question if you have one or if Aditi or, or Jihang can see the chat window, uh, that's great. Okay, should we just move forward? Great, let's move ahead. This is Emmy the cat. Uh, 
She's Siamese. She walks on a leash uh, and she's not Schrodinger's cat. She's 100% alive. If you're lucky, she'll make an appearance later in the talk. Um, okay, so the first story I want to tell you is about making matter out of optical photons. Okay, and the second story is going to be about making matter out of microwave photons, time permitting. So for this first story, uh, I want to talk to you about making topological matter, making Laughlin states of light. Uh, but the challenge is always that, at least when I started thinking about these ideas, I didn't actually really know that much about uh, Landau levels or topological matter at all. So I thought what might be nice is to take just a couple minutes as we start for me to give you a quick introduction uh, to the fractional quantum Hall effect from the perspective uh, of an experimentalist. I once gave this talk at Stanford uh, and uh, there was someone sitting in the front row who I eventually discovered was Bob Laughlin from his questions. So uh, uh, assuming Bob is not here today, uh, it, this discussion will, will be a little bit less nerve wracking for me. Okay, so when I put a particle in a magnetic field, what we know is that classically I get cyclotron orbits of this charged particle in the magnetic field. And the interesting thing is even though this Hamiltonian doesn't look manifestly translationally invariant, what we know is that classically, anywhere I put the particle in space, I get cyclotron orbit. So there's some translational invariance to this story, right? But what we also know is that no matter how fast I start my particle moving, I always get orbits that are the same frequency. And so what that says is that the eigenstates are going to be uniformly spaced in energy. So the two things we know is that one, we have a translational invariance, which means that there will be degeneracies in the eigenstates once we go to quantum mechanics. And the fact that the eigenstates can only live at multiples of this cyclotron frequency and energy um, means that we have these discrete energy levels. So then when we look at the quantum mechanical version of the story, what we can see is that we're going to have sets of degenerate states spaced in energy by the cyclotron frequency. Right? Where again, the fact that we have many degenerate states here comes from the translational invariance of the system. Uh, and the spacing of the states comes from the fact that we only get dynamics at the cyclotron frequency in the classical limit. Okay, So this lowest family of eigenstates is called the lowest Landau level. Um, and I'm going to write these states out for you in a perhaps less than obvious way. Um, but it will be important for what comes next. I can draw these states, instead of using any kind of translational invariance, I can uh, index them by how much angular momentum they have about any particular origin that I want. So there's a state with zero units of angular momentum. There's a state with one h-bar unit of angular momentum, two h-bar, three h-bar, four h-bar. And there are these rings of increasing size. So if I plotted the phase that you would get 2 pi of phase for the first ring, 4 pi of phase for the second ring, 6 pi, 8 pi, 10 pi, so forth, okay? So one reason that we've used this is that these states are very easy to write down. Um, if you just write a complex number z, a complex coordinate, which is the x coordinate plus i times the y coordinate. So if you plot z in the complex plane, it's the position of your particle. And so the point is the state with angular momentum l can be written as z to the l e to the minus magnitude of z squared. Okay, so the way you should think of this is you can write this z to the l as r to the l e to the i l theta and e to the minus magnitude of z squared is e to the minus r squared. And so the point is this r to the l e to the minus r squared generates a maximum at some radius given by basically the square root of l. And the e to the i l theta gives me the phase winding that I need for this eigenstate, OK? So this is uh, very nice. This numbers the eigenstates. But then the interesting thing happens in the fractional quantum Hall effect when I add interactions between my particles. So basically, I want it to pay an energy cost when two particles get near each other in space, OK? Um, so classically, these dynamics are very, very messy. But quantum mechanically, the simplest thing you can write down is sort of this first term is the second quantized Hamiltonian for individual particles. 
And the second term is an energy cost that I pay when the two particles are on top of each other in space, okay? So the picture you should now have in mind is that as long as these interactions are weak compared to the spacing between the, 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 the Landau levels, weak compared to the cyclotron frequency, uh, what I can say is that the interactions keep all of the particles that live in the lowest Landau level in the lowest Landau level, okay? So let's think about what they could possibly do to a pair of particles in the lowest Landau level. Well, these, uh, this interaction is central, so it has to conserve angular momentum. So all it can do to one particle with one unit of angular momentum and another particle with four units of angular momentum is shift the energy of that pair state or induce them to collide and exchange some angular momentum. Okay, that's all that can happen in this system. So now I can ask you a question, which is, I've got this Hamiltonian, which corresponds to a bunch of particles living in the lowest Landau level, pairwise hopping back and forth between states that conserve angular momentum for the pair. What's the ground state of this Hamiltonian? Um, so if you're anything like me, what you probably do is throw up your hands and say, uh, where are all the theorists? Did they come to the talk? Maybe one of them can tell us the answer. Um, and uh, it turns out that uh, that's a, the right thing to do. Uh, Bob Laughlin got a Nobel Prize for answering this question. Uh, and the answer is that uh, if you write the states in terms of this complex coordinate Z of each particle, the Laughlin state for bosons is a product over all of the pairs of particle i and j, zi minus zj squared, e to the minus sum over the particles magnitude of zk squared. Now, why is this the, uh, the ground state? Well, the point is the zi minus zj squared makes the wave function zero whenever the particles are in the same location. So we're not paying any interaction energy, okay? Um, and then the point is that if you look at the location of any given particle in any term in this product, we'll end up with, say for the fourth particle, z to the four, or z four to some power times e to the minus magnitude of z four squared. So that's a state in the lowest Landau level. So we're also in the lowest energy eigenstate of this first term, okay? And so Laughlin pointed out that basically for any, for bosons for any even power here, we have a ground state uh, of this Hamiltonian of some density. And so the point is the number of particles you have in your system determines what that exponent uh, should be. Uh, and then there are all sorts of very interesting stories about putting holes into this system and how they braid around each other uh, and anions and fractional statistics and fractional charge. But what we need to answer today is if we wanna study any of that physics, we need to realize this system uh, in some material platform, okay? So we would like to study it here with photons, okay? So the challenges are going to be one, how do we uh, make photons behave as though they live in a magnetic field? How do we generate a Lorentz force between the photons? And two, how do we make these photons interact with each other? And once we've done those two things, the last question is gonna be, uh, how do we build some kind of interesting topological state of light? Okay, so, uh, great. The central premise of what I'm gonna tell you about is that photons in a multimode optical cavity behave like massive particles in a harmonic trap. So I'd like to give you a little bit of flavor of why that is before we start jumping into the data. So what I've got here is two mirrors shown in blue. And uh, my claim is that if I inject light into the cavity formed by these two mirrors, the light inside of the cavity will act like a massive harmonically trapped particle. Okay. So how should, in, in the transverse plane anyway, so how should we understand why that happens? Well, the simplest way is to just trace the ray as it bounces back and forth in the cavity and watch where it crosses this middle plane of the cavity, okay? The idea is that the curvature of the mirrors prevents the light from just bouncing upward forever, right? It sends the light back down if it's moving upwards. It sends it up if it's moving downwards. So this is, this is our harmonic trap generated by the curvature of the mirrors. 
And the tilt of the ray combined with the, uh, the, the fact that the cavity redirects the light back to where it started uh, in, in this central plane creates a situation where tilt of the ray corresponds to a transverse momentum, okay? Uh, so as a consequence, if we just coarse grain over the round trip dynamics, we literally get uh, stroboscopic evolution of a massive particle in a harmonic trap, okay? Um, so, so we can be more formal about this if we want, but, uh, but the point is that propagation converts tilt into, uh, in, into translation. And so that kind of sets the mass of the photons, the effective mass, and the mirror curvature traps the photons, prevents them from going up or down forever. So that corresponds to our harmonic trap. So let's try to understand this in a wave picture. In the wave picture, what we can say is that we know that the eigenstates of a, of a quantum harmonic oscillator are Hermite Gauss in space and uniformly spaced in energy. What are the modes of an optical cavity? Well, for people who've played with lasers, you know the modes of an optical cavity, the transverse modes, are Hermite Gauss in space and uniformly spaced in energy. So the picture you should now have in mind in this kind of wave picture is that if I send light into the cavity off center, I can write that as a superposition of the lowest transverse mode of the cavity and the first excited transverse mode of the cavity. And because those have different frequencies, half of a cycle later of this difference frequency, this plus sign has become a minus sign. And now the photon is offset to the left of the axis of the cavity. Okay, and that's where this harmonic motion comes from. And indeed, if this story sounds familiar, it should because this is exactly how we understand coherent state dynamics of any particle in a, in a harmonic trap. So uh, for those of you uh, who went to school in the US, you learned about this at some point in college. For Russians, you learned about this uh, in elementary school. Uh, and the rest of us, well, I mean, I, that's probably, that's most of physicists, right? Uh, I, I don't know where, uh, where the, when the East Asians learn about it, probably closer to elementary school. Um, anyway, so this is the picture you should have in your mind. This is an artist's rendition of a cavity um, where I'm the artist, which is why it doesn't look so good. Um, but you've got these, these two mirrors, okay? The light is bouncing back and forth between them. And the idea is that we've coarse grained out the motion in that direction and the dynamics in the transverse plane of the cavity corresponds to a massive harmonically trapped particle. So this idea has been used for photon BEC experiments and exciton polariton experiments. Uh, and we've developed a, a formal Floquet picture of this uh, if you're interested. Um, but the important question for us is, okay, the free propagation gives the photon a mass in the transverse plane, the mirror curvature uh, generates a trap this is a p squared term, this is an x squared term, but we need a magnetic field, which is an xp term. So is there something we can do to this cavity to generate a magnetic field for our photons, right? We need a Lorentz force if we wanna to study topological physics, if we wanna study fractional quantum Hall physics. Well, what I'd like to convince you is that twisting the resonator out of the plane, whatever that means, generates a magnetic field for light. So how does this work? Well, let's think a little bit about a periscope. If I have these two mirrors making up a periscope and I look at a tree through the periscope, let's just trace the image of the tree through the periscope, right? The tree comes out right side up. But what if the top mirror is rotated by 90 degrees with respect to the bottom mirror? Well, now the image of the tree comes out rotated by 90 degrees. And indeed, as I rotate the top mirror relative to the bottom mirror, the image gets rotated continuously. So if I could make a cavity with some fixed twist between my top mirror and my bottom mirror, and then add two more mirrors to close the round trip path, that will generate a round trip image rotation of whatever the light is doing as it goes through the cavity. Okay, so the idea is to take a two mirror cavity and twist it out of the plane. Uh, and what we expect is that this twist generates, uh, turns the lab frame into a rotating frame. So in addition to the mirror curvature providing trapping and the, long, the propagation generating a photon mass, this twist out of the plane generates uh, 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 what amounts to a rotating frame for the lab frame, 
And we learned again as undergrads or elementary school students, depending that uh, when you uh, have uh, a lab frame, you can understand it alternatively through what are normally fictitious forces if you go into the rotating frame. But since our lab frame is the rotating frame, these fictitious forces are actually real forces on the photon and they are a Coriolis force, which is like omega cross P and a centrifugal force, which pushes you radially outward from the axis about the tw that you're twisted about. So the interesting thing is omega cross P is basically V cross B, right? Uh, because P is MV. So this is M omega cross V. So uh, that gives me my magnetic field for my photons. I, have, I now have my uh, uh, Lorentz force. And this centrifugal force, this radially outward pointing force is equivalent to trapping my photons in an in a anti-harmonic potential that I can just cancel with the mirror curvature. So the idea is gonna be that if I had a four mirror cavity like the one I've shown here, it would correspond to a photon just living in a 2D uh, harmonic trap. And so the eigenstates would be the eigenstates of a 2D quantum harmonic oscillator. The lowest energy eigenstate is this uh, Gaussian mode. And then we can have an excitation along X or an excitation along Y or two excitations along X, one along X along, along Y and so forth. Okay, but as I twist the cavity out of the plane, what we see is that one way to think about that is that these can no longer be eigenstates because on each round trip through the cavity, the image gets rotated a little bit, right? And if the image gets rotated, well, this can't be an eigenstate because this doesn't come back to itself under a rotation, right? It becomes something different. On the other hand, these two states can mix to form a ring, in fact, two rings, depending on whether I write this plus I times that or this minus I times that, right? And those rings have phase winding. And so the point is, if the twist is in the same direction as the phase winding, right? Then the energy of the state will go down. And if the twist is in the opposite direction, the energy of the state will go up. And so if we watch the eigenstates as we twist the cavity, they immediately become these rings with increasing amounts of angular momentum. And so this is a super cool thing. Just putting the right amount of twist into the cavity such that all of these states become degenerate gives us a Landau level for light. Okay, so we've made these single particle eigenstates that we wanted. How do we do this in practice? Well, we just take four super polished mirrors we stuff them into some 3D printed structure that aligns them exactly to one another. We adjust the length of the cavity until it's perfect. Um, and uh, we get these nice ring modes. Uh, and indeed, we can look at spectroscopy of the ring modes as we vary the length of the cavity, which is sort of equivalent to varying the twist. Um, and we can see that there's a point where the modes become degenerate and we can zoom in on that point. This is our lowest Landau level. And we can see that we can make all of these single particle eigenstates degenerate to better than a megahertz, right? Uh, well, maybe it's a megahertz or two here. And the interesting point is what that means is now if we could make our photons interact with each other by more than a megahertz, we could start to see these angular momentum conserving collisions to start to make Laughlin states out of light. Okay, um, so let me just say, you can read more about these, the single particle story of the individual photons in this paper. And indeed, we have a whole bunch of other papers uh, where we tr talk about trapping the photons in a magnetic field on the surface of a cone and measuring the churn number of the Landau level uh, using uh, this Kitaev formalism and measuring uh, mean orbital spin at the curvature of the cone tip. And uh, uh, anyway, there's all kinds of really fun science there uh, that, that you can look into, but that's not really the story I wanna tell you today. The story I wanna tell you today is about how we add interactions between these photons and then build a Laughlin state, okay? So how do we make the photons interact with each other? Well, I told you that we have to use matter to do that, okay? And the idea is to use a technique developed uh, by Vlad and Vuletic and, uh, uh, Misha Lukin at MIT and Harvard, as well as Charles Adams uh, 
in Durham, Michael Fleischauer, others. The, I, the, the technique is called Rydberg electromagnetically induced transparency. Uh, I don't wanna go too much into the details of this. I just wanna give you a flavor of what happens. Uh, the idea is that when I send light through matter, the light always, the light slows down, right? This is just something we know. Light has some index of refraction. And so when you send light through matter, it slows down. Why does it slow down? Well, in some sense, because the light spends some time as an atomic excitation or because the light is backscattered and then re-forward scattered, uh, what have you. The story we wanna focus on here is a situation where when my light goes into the matter, it gets absorbed by one of the atoms. And then we use a very, uh, short wavelength laser to excite that atom up to a Rydberg state. These Rydberg states are very long lived. Okay, and what this means is the light gets absorbed by the atoms. The atom goes up to the Rydberg state, whichever atom does the absorption, and then eventually uh, gets de-excited by this laser, re-emitted in whatever direction it was initially moving in and continues on. But it goes very, very slowly because this Rydberg state can be very, very long lived. Okay, so people have slowed light down to a few meters per second in this way. It can go extremely slowly. Um, now, the thing that's interesting though, is if a second photon comes in, the story gets much more complicated because we use a Rydberg state near N equals 100. And near N equals 100, the electronic orbitals of these Rydberg atoms are several microns across. They are gigantic, right? A normal electronic orbital is like a 10th of a nanometer, right? Or half a 10th of a nanometer, it's a Bohr radius. This orbital is two microns, right? Almost as thick as a human hair. And so what this means is when the second photon goes into the medium, if it were gonna go slowly, it would need to excite one of these atoms up to this Rydberg state, right? But because the Rydberg electrons are so huge, if the photons are near each other, will we'll be th th this for the second atom, this Rydberg state will be shifted by many megahertz in energy, right? Because, uh, the, because of the electron electron repulsion in these huge orbitals. Uh, and so what that means is that if the second photon gets near the first photon, it doesn't get slowed down. It just goes straight through the medium as though the atoms weren't there. And so what this means is that the first photon generates a position dependent index of refraction for the second photon, which basically looks like a lens. And so the second photon lenses off of the first photon uh, and then the first photon leaks out. And this effectively generates a collision uh, between the photons. So you can build an effective field theory of interacting photons in this way. And so now what you should have in mind is in our case, our photons are repeatedly going through this medium and carrying a collective atomic excitation with them that we call a polariton, okay, a Rydberg polariton in this case. And these quasi particles, these Rydberg polaritons can interact through the Rydberg part, okay? And collide with one another. So let me first show you a very simple experiment demonstrating that that works. What we do is we build a four mirror cavity like the one I've shown here. We magneto optically trap a gas of rubidium atoms. We load it into an optical lattice, transport it several centimeters into our optical cavity. And then you can take an image of this gas. So this is the direction of the cavity mode, which is about 20 microns across. We have a single mode cavity for now. We don't have the many modes that we need for a Laughlin state for the experiment I'm describing right now. And so the point is now we can compress our gas down until it's very, very thin along the cavity axis so that the, uh, the electronic orbitals are so huge that you can't even fit two next to each other in either the longitudinal or transverse direction within this cavity mode. And so now what you can do is send light through the cavity and see if these photons interact, okay? So the idea is for, for the experts, these, when we probe the cavity and look at the light coming out, if we probe very weakly, we see a spectrum like the one I'm showing here. These two tiny little outer peaks are the vacuum Rabi peaks. This is the atomic P state hybridizing with a cavity photon. If you don't understand what that means, don't worry about it. It's not important. All of the action is this middle peak, which is much narrower because the Rydberg state is very long lived. In fact, it's even narrower than the bare cavity resonance. We can make it narrower by as much as a factor of 100. And the interesting point now is if we send 
multiple photons into the cavity, what we expect to happen is once one photon is in there, it shifts all of the Rydberg state energies, which shifts the energy of the cavity mode. So as a consequence, a second photon will bounce off. So let me explain just how weird this is. Uh, this cavity that I'm showing here is like six or seven centimeters long. And I'm claiming that it can hold one photon at a time until that first photon leaks out and then a second photon can enter. Uh, so we perform correlation measurements of the light coming out of this cavity. And what we see is conditioned on detecting a photon at this time t equals zero, for the next 10 or 20 microseconds, a second photon will never come out. And that time scale is basically how long it takes to re-excite the system uh, after the first photon leaves. And so this really tells you that this cavity is only holding one excitation at a time, which is quite surprising for such a macroscopic object, right? Uh, so here's where all the action is. Um, let's put it all together and we can make a, uh, a Laughlin state for light. So the idea is to kind of combine um, this magnetic field for light in a twisted cavity with photon-photon uh, scattering by putting atoms in the cavity to make a Laughlin state. So I know this says in press, uh, the paper is published at this point, but if you wanna look at it for free, this is the, uh, the archive reference. Okay, so. To me, in some ways, this is the most interesting bit of this story. We've got the ingredients for making a Laughlin state. The ground state of the system is in some sense a Laughlin state, but the challenge of course is the real ground state is no photons in the cavity, right? They'll just leak out. So the question is how do you prepare this topological state when it seems like you've got all of the ingredients? So let me give you a quantum uh, optometrist view of how that, uh, can happen. Um, am I a quantum optometrist or a quantum ophthalmologist? I don't know. Um, so uh, the experiment that I just showed you said, let's look at the lowest mode of the cavity and, uh, and inject light into it. And what we say is we can put one photon in, but due to the repulsion between the photons, I cannot put a second photon in because that state is now at a different energy. Great. What happens if I repeat this experiment instead of sending light onto this lowest angular momentum state, sending it into the cavity in this first excited angular momentum state, one unit of angular momentum, this ring mode, right? Well, what you might say is the interactions between those two photons are a little bit weaker, right? Because the mode's a little bit bigger, right? But that basically all we'll see is that this two excitation level will be shifted down a little bit in energy. But it turns out that's not quite the whole story. Because what can also happen, as I told you in our introduction at the beginning, is that these two photons can collide, conserve angular momentum, and go into these two other states, one with zero units of angular momentum and one with two units of angular momentum. And so the point is, now what we need to do is actually think about all of the possible things that can happen. The two photons can stay in the state with one unit of angular momentum, and the interaction gives that a, a shift in energy, right? Or these two photons, each with one unit of angular momentum, can collide and become one with zero and one with two. And once they're there, that state has a shift due to the interactions. And the pair can also Rabi oscillate back to the state that they started in, right? So we need to actually diagonalize this two particle subspace of interacting states of photons to, uh, to figure out what we expect to happen here, right? Um, and so we could do that, but we can also just write down what the answer is because I told you before, right? It's this two photon Laughlin state, right? Uh, so let's see what that has to do with these states. So I told you that the, the Laughlin state is Z1 minus Z2, where these are the locations of the two particles, squared e to the minus magnitude of Z1 squared plus magnitude of Z2 squared, right? So let's expand out that quadratic and I have z1 squared z2 to the zero plus z1 to the zero z2 squared minus two z1 z2, right? And so what that means is I can write each of these terms out, this z1 squared e to the minus magnitude z1 squared, z2 to the zero e to the minus magnitude of z2 squared as 
one photon with two units of angular momentum and one photon with zero units of angular momentum, right? And the other one is just the reverse. And then this minus two Z one Z two is each of them having one unit of angular momentum, okay? And so the point is, what we expect is that if I inject light where both photons have one unit of angular momentum, there will be some energy splitting between the Laughlin state, which is actually a superposition of these two states, and what I'll call an anti-Laughlin state, where uh, that it's sort of the opposite sign here. And so if I just inject photons at the bare energy of this mode, what should come out is Laughlin states of light. So you can think of this as kind of a Laughlin filter. The anti-Laughlin state reflects off of the cavity. The Laughlin state gets transmitted through the cavity. Okay, uh, so in practice, what we do is we generate photons with orbital angular momentum by reflecting our light off of uh, a DMD, what's inside of a data projector. We put a hologram on it that generates these photons with angular momentum. We send them through this uh, twisted cavity collider where they can interact with each other. And then we take a look at the photons that come out in either angular momentum space using mode sorters or in real space using a, a single detector at different locations in space. And we look at the, the correlations. Now, before we move forward, let me just point out that in fact, uh, there is some subtlety coming from uh, the practical implementation. So we don't use angular momenta 0, 1, and 2. We use 3, 6, and 9. But that doesn't qualitatively change the story. Uh, it just changes the numbers a little bit. OK, so how does this work in practice? Well, if we have just a single mode, we saw that the photons come out one at a time. We never get pairs of photons out. If, on the other hand, we send photons in with six units of angular momentum, we see that actually sometimes we can get pairs of photons out. Right now, for the data I'm showing you here, we're not looking, we're not sorting by angular momentum. We're just seeing that pairs of photons can go through the cavity at the same time. Okay, so um, what we need to do is zoom in on this region in the middle and understand what's going on in terms of those pairs of photons, right? Because somehow the fact that pairs can go through says that there's some pair state that doesn't cost a lot of energy to inject into the cavity. So this is just showing that in fact, our modes are not exactly degenerate as I told you, they ought to be in a Laughlin state. They have an energy difference. And so in practice, there's a flow, an additional flow, flow K trick that we use to, to do physics in the rotating frame. But again, that's not so important for, for what we're trying to understand right now. What we can do is look at the correlations of the pairs of photons coming out, uh, each with uh, uh, this middle state, what I called one unit of angular momentum, but here it's actually six units. Uh, and you see that we sometimes still get pairs of photons here. But the really interesting thing is if we look at correlations between one unit, one photon with z three units and one with nine units, or what I previously called zero and two units, those photons can only come out in pairs. Okay, And if we look at the relative rates of these two processes, what we see is that, you know, point, I mean, you, you have to square these, but like 0.6%, of the time we get out photons with the angular momentum that we sent in and 40% of the time they come out after having collided and gone to this other pair state. But you might ask, what's the phase between these two? Because to make a Laughlin state, the phase needs to be pi. There needs, the, we need to have a minus sign here. That's how the photons avoid each other. If this phase is zero, Right. Well, what that says is that the photons are attracted to each other. And in fact, we could just have a statistical mixture of these two, in which case we haven't made a pure state at all. So what we really need to do is look in real space instead of angular momentum space to see that the photons avoid each other. So I don't want to go through the technical details too much of how we do that, except to say that we can look in real space and see that these photons uh, avoid each other in space because the state is rotating in time, we can look at a particular point in space and by looking at correlations in time, see, uh, see the angular correlations uh, 
between the photons. So what we end up with at the end of the day is that we've made this Laughlin state of photons. Um, and indeed, because the photons are living on a cone, uh, another piece of the story that I didn't tell you today, you can really think of this as a two photon Laughlin state living on a cone uh, with a quasi hole at the origin. Okay, um, so, so that is the end of, uh, of that story. Um, and I see that I've spoken for 42 minutes. So the question is, should we just end here or should I spend another five minutes to tell you a little bit about uh, making mod insulators of, uh, of uh, microwave photons? Emmy's just yawning. She's not, she's not a threatening cat. Jihang, what do you prefer, Aditi? Well, so so, I would like to uh, listen to the uh, microwave part. Although I have uh, a couple of questions actually, but uh, we can do that, you know, afterwards. Um, yeah. Okay, I'll be I'll be quick then. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yep. Okay, so here we go. Uh, so I want to just tell you briefly about making mod insulators of microwave photons. Um, and so the first question is, what is a mod insulator? Okay, so one, what is an insulator? An insulator is something that doesn't conduct electricity. Uh, again, I know we're not mostly hard condensed matter people here. So the question is, why doesn't uh, an insulator conduct electricity or uh, conduct electricity? Well, the typical reason is that the top band is full. And so the point is, if I have a conductor where I have uh, say one electron uh, per atom in the uh, in the valence band here, then that band is half full. Okay. The point is that you know each each atom can hold two electrons, one spin up and one spin down, uh, and so we have this half full band. If I apply an electric field, I get some shift in the uh, momentum distribution, and so this difference in the number of electrons moving left and moving right gives me electrical conductivity. If the band is full, then when I apply the electric field, what I get is uh, basically that the electrons that leave this end of the Brillouin zone reappear over there. So these ones have, uh, the ones on the moving to the right exactly cancel the ones moving to the left, so there's no conductivity. But here's the interesting thing. There are materials that have one electron per atom, but that still do not conduct electricity. And the point is that this whole picture has broken down for those materials, okay? When I drew this, these are momentum states of the electrons, right? And if the repulsion between the electrons is stronger than the tunneling of the electrons, that, then you can't write the, uh, the momentum states as the good eigenstates of the system. Uh, and uh, the electrons sort of prefer to crystallize. This electron doesn't want to hop onto the next one because, uh, because of the repulsion, right? Uh, and so uh, rather than uh, Pauli exclusion, uh, determining the ordering uh, interactions determine the ordering. And this gives us a mod insulator rather than a band insulator. Okay, so the question is, can we explore this physics with light? People have been wanting to do this for a long time. There are a whole bunch of proposals for how one might do it. Uh, and indeed, there are a whole bunch of uh, pictures of how it ought to work. Um, our approach looks most similar to Andrew Hauck's. Uh, and so let me just quickly tell you how we make the lattice sites for this system. We need something that can hold microwave photons, okay? An LC circuit is a great object for holding microwave photons. It's very happy to hold photons of frequency one over root LC, and you can put as many in as you want. The problem is that we would like to pay some energy cost to have them into to, to, to put multiple photons into the site, right? Because we need to have a situation where the photons strongly repel each other. So how do we uh, achieve that? Well, the simplest example you can think of of this is uh, the uh, transformers on your power lines, right? You can hear them kind of buzzing. And the reason they're buzzing is that there's so much current running through the inductors right, that uh, the magnetic field back, act, back acts on the coil and changes its size, right? And so the point is, when you change the size of the coil, you change the resonant frequency of this LC circuit, right? And so what that means is that you effectively have a photon-photon interaction. Depending on how many photons you put into the circuit, you get some constriction of the coil. The problem is 
To see that in a classical system, you need many, many, many photons, like a mole of photons or something totally ridiculous, right? So the key is to make this inductor as small as you possibly can. And the smallest inductor we can make is a Josephson junction, right? Uh, and this inductor can have so much uh, nonlinearity that for the first photon that you put into this thing, the transition frequency is 4.5 gigahertz. But then for the second photon, the frequency is 4.2 gigahertz. That is to say we have 300 megahertz of interaction energy between the photons. Here it's attractive rather than repulsive. So you may have heard a little of this story before, and, and that's because the lowest two levels of this object are what people in the circuit quantum electrodynamics community use as a transmon qubit. Okay, so people like Google, IBM, uh, Rob Shulkoff's group and Michelle Devere's group, both at Yale, Dave Schuster, my colleague at UChicago, use these techniques to make a quantum computer because the, the microwaves that you use to excite yourself from this zero photon state to the one photon state do not excite you to the two photon state, right? And that gives you a qubit, it gives you a good two level system. So the idea that Dave Schuster and I, my collaborator at UChicago came up with was to use exactly this same device, except instead of insisting on only zero or one photons, you can think of this two photon state as the photons being attracted to each other. So the really cool thing is now, if you want to couple the lattice to each other, you just use uh, a capacitor. And so we can create a situation where we have a tunneling energy of 10 megahertz, an interaction energy of 300 megahertz, and the photons live for like 40 microseconds. And it turns out this corresponds, if you multiply the lifetime by the interaction energy to like 12,000 collisions or 400 tunneling events, uh, and, uh, and, and that's on the order of what you can get with cold atoms. It's really a wonderful situation. So the last requirement here is some way to irreversibly populate this system. We need an object that you can put photons in that, that, that constantly replenishes itself with photons. Uh, so that we can irreversibly fill the system. So the idea is imagine that this leftmost object here is a special lattice that as soon as a photon tunnels out of it, it refills itself so that the photon cannot tunnel back in due to the interactions, right? And so the idea is now this everything would stop except that this photon on the right can hop over and then the photon in our special site can hop into the system. But before the photon can hop back into this reservoir, the reservoir refills itself, right? And so on and so forth. And this will stabilize any incompressible phase of matter. And so there have been a number of ideas about how to do this, um, including one from our group. Um, but I'd like to just describe to you how we actually did do it uh, in reality. The basic idea is uh, just to realize this site that automatically refills itself by if you can't just drive from zero to one here with a microwave tone, because if you did, that same tone would take the photon back out. What we need to do is take a, a trick from uh, generating an, an inversion in a laser and create a situation where this doubly excited state decays really fast. How do we do that? Well, we use the fact that this two to one transition is different from the one to zero transition to couple a very lossy resonator to the cavity that's resonant only with this two to one transition. Okay, and now we can drive from zero to two, the thing rapidly decays from two to one and, uh, and, we've, and we've made what we want. So, you know, there's a whole other story about characterizing these objects, which I'll skip, but let me just point out that the exciting thing is the temporal filling dynamics. These are the individual sites of the mod insulator. This Y axis is time since we started filling and this uh, chemical potential object lives at the right edge of the system. So when we turn on the dynamics, the system fills itself up to unit occupancy in a few microseconds. Uh, and in fact, you can see that there's some kind of uh, essentially Lee Robinson limited uh, filling front here uh, that, uh, that moves us towards this incompressible phase. Uh, and indeed, we can also take one excitation out of the system and in the absence of the refilling, we just see this whole random walk around through the system. And if we have the stabilizer on this chemical potential, the hole can walk one way across the system and then basically get eaten by the, by the, the filler. 
So you can read more about that in this paper, but I guess I would just say that broadly, you know, in the uh, circuit system, it's a beautiful platform for uh, starting to try to understand uh, thermalization and driven dissipation and entanglement in these uh, in these driven dissipative systems, right? We always say we want to make systems as isolated as possible, but of course, in the real world, every system is damp. So I think it's actually quite interesting to think about how coupling to one of these thermal reservoirs impacts string order and other quantum fluctuations. In, uh, in a strongly interacting system. And then of course, with the, uh, with the optical photons, what we'd really like to do is uh, start putting quasi holes into the system and braiding anions. So uh, with that, I think I will uh, conclude. Uh, I will skip telling you anything about wormholes for light in case, unless people are interested, and in which case I can tell you more about that afterwards. But let me just point out that this work was done by a bunch of really hardworking, wonderful students and postdocs, um, and uh, in close collaboration with my colleague, Dave Schuster, in the, uh, who does circuit cubing in this work. So with that, thank you. Okay, thank you so much for the wonderful, uh, wonderful uh, talk. Um, um, I do have a couple of questions, but uh, but uh, uh, I guess uh, maybe maybe we should let the audience um, um, ask their questions first. Yeah. Anything? No. You can just unmute yourself. That's fine with me. Or Jihan, we can start with yours. Whatever. Well, just, just a general question, if I may. Well, thank you for a very nice presentation. Um, is there anything um, what one can learn from the, the photonic systems uh, that, that cannot that easily be understood in the electronic ones in a strong coupling regime or, or maybe more handles on, on, on that kind of dynamics? Yeah. And then you also mentioned about the anions. This is a different question, I understand. But what, what's, what's an anion in that context? Okay, yeah, so let's start with the first question. Um, I guess I would say we do have microscopic access to the structure of the states. And so up to this point, we've just been realizing these Hamiltonians, right? Uh, but I think particularly in the case of the circuit platform, the next thing we're gonna do is look at the quantum fluctuations, uh, you know, correlations of doublons and holes, as we look at, as a function of distance from this thermalizing site. What you can see is that the site that we're using to stabilize the many body state um, actually has an entropy dump, right? It's that extra, anytime you lose a photon from your system, you dump entropy into that lossy resonator. And so it's interesting to think about to what extent the quantum fluctuations of what we think of as the many body ground state of the system uh, persist in the presence of this stabilizing drive and how it varies as you move away in space from the stabilizer, right? Uh, and so I think it, there, you know, for this, the small systems we've studied so far, you could probably do it numerically, but as we scale up in size to 50 or 60 or 100 sites, right, uh, and start to look at these correlations, I think that will really be things that there's no other platform that you can really uh, explore that in. Um, regarding the anions, this is a very neat uh, kind of a story. The, uh, the basic point is that the, the anionic excitations are just holes, right? So if we stabilize the Laughlin state, and indeed we're trying to develop these stabilization schemes also for the optical photons, if you stabilize the Laughlin state with something like a laser beam that repelled particles, at a particular location in space, repelled photons, repelled Rydberg atoms, whatever. Um, and indeed, we'll, we'll, we'll change the energy of the Rydberg state. That will be good enough for us. That will bind an anion at that point in your Laughlin state, right, in your, in your fluid. Um, so you could imagine just sending in two laser beams to repel your Rydberg atoms and binding anions to those two and then braiding them by bringing them around each other. But the problem is there's no way to measure the braiding phase there, right? Uh, so the really cool idea that comes from Fabian Grutzt is you bind this middle anion to a laser beam, but this outer anion, you actually bind to another atom 
that repels all of, so, you know, you have say a cesium Rydberg atom, okay? And you bind the second anion to that Rydberg atom. And now the cool thing is you can make a trap for that cesium atom that depends upon what Rydberg state the atom is in, mm -hmm. okay? And so what you do is you move one of the two Rydberg states in space around the other anion and you leave the other Rydberg state exactly where it was, right? Because you have two different laser traps, one that addresses one Rydberg state, one that addresses the other. And now after you do that and you put these two traps back on top of each other, this state gets this braiding phase and you can directly measure it in the spin of that atom. Isn't that cool? Yep. So I think this is something that would just be extremely hard to do in the solid state. Now, of course, the honest truth is it will also be extremely hard to do with, uh, with our photons, but you can, you can at least envision it. So that's what we're pushing towards there. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so 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 maybe um, uh, following up on the uh, on the uh, uh, little bit of comparisons between uh, uh, between um, uh, this dissipative uh, picture of uh, superconducting a uh, uh, platform, because I, I actually remember a couple of years ago when I was a postdoc in, in a JQI seminar that you were you were saying that okay this dissipative toolbox is 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 the amazing thing that that doesn't exist uh, or or doesn't have the same equivalence in atomic systems but i always thought that that the analogy is with optical pumping right so for example this uh, this photonic mod insulator right um can i can i think about it as you know a clever way of the optical pumping uh, such that you know the end um, uh, the end is a reservoir that that I can uh, uh, have a one way process uh, and maybe I can do this actually uh, maybe not with uh, maybe with, not with um, single species atoms uh, uh, either in optical lattices or in an ion chain but let's say let's say if I have a mixed species ion chain where I can control the um, the uh, phononic interactions. Do you think the smart insulator can be realized there? Yeah, so I, I, th I think that's a really great, great question. And I think the answer is yes. Uh, I think the cold atom community could do it in optical lattices too. The basic point is we always think about optical pumping as something that we do for individual particles, right? Yes. And yes. what this paper is fundamentally saying mm -hmm. is if the energy gaps in your mm -hmm. system are large enough, Mm -hmm. you can actually optically pump into many body states. And I yes. guess what I would say is that fundamentally, mm -hmm. anytime a system thermalizes, mm -hmm. in some sense, that's what you're doing, right? When you cool one system with another system, you're, you're implementing some kind of equivalent of optical pumping to dump the entropy into that system. So mm -hmm. yes, I think you could definitely do this in a dual species ion chain. In fact, you could probably do it in a single species ion chain if you locally address the atom at the end of the chain. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Right, you know, you could uh, yeah. address it. I mean, in fact, you guys do play these kinds of games with like- uh, Quantum error correction and things like quantum that. Quantum error correction or like driving the red sideband to cool a single atom, right? Yep. If yep. you could spectroscopically resolve within the red sideband an interaction, a spin-spin interaction, between between the ions, mm -hmm. you could you could pump into uh, into uh, uh, you know some kind of a singlet state, or in a long chain, you could actually optically pump into an antiferromagnet. I think. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Yeah. But anyway, I think I, to me, like in some sense, the fact that you can do it with circuits is fun. But the really interesting thing is that it's a new perspective for. Their, uh, for, for just for thinking about what it means for, to cool a system off. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so so I guess the other question I had was a little bit more, uh, more, uh, I don't know, maybe, maybe maybe it's a little more primitive. Uh, so so back back to the single particle uh, topology that uh, you used uh, twist 
uh, twisted cavities to generate, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, so essentially, you went into a higher dimension in order for the two D physics to uh, to behave uh, differently, mm -hmm. right? So, so maybe this is maybe this is very elementary, but but I was wondering, is this necessary that uh, that uh, you uh, go into a high dimensional system that that um, there's no there's no other tricks that you can play uh, in two D uh, to, so, uh, to yeah. This is, that's a great question. Um, I would make an analogy to cold atoms, mm -hmm. right? Uh, I and 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 in fact ions as well, right? When people in cold atom experiments want to generate a gauge field for the atoms, mm -hmm. what they usually do is use Raman transitions, right? Sure. To another internal state of the atom. And so effectively what they're doing is adding higher dimensions to their system, right? And mm -hmm. like controlling how you access those dimensions and come back mm -hmm. to, uh, to generate a gauge field for the atoms, right? And in fact, that's also how uh, people generate gates between ions, which I'm sure you know, right? Like uh, you, you generate the gate by coupling to this phononic bus. And so I guess I would say in some sense, all of these Hamiltonian engineering ideas at some level are about using additional degrees of freedom in your system to modify the underlying physics, right? In our case, we've managed to do it all with the light, right? Which is nice because to get the gauge fields or the magnetic fields working, we didn't actually even have to add any atoms to the system, which I think is what really made this go. We could separate the challenge of making the magnetic field from making the interactions and then only combine them at the end, right? But uh, this increasing the dimensionality and then bringing it back down, I think is a tool that, we, uh, that, that sort of has to be used. So maybe another way of saying this is if you don't wanna add a dimension to your cavity, if you don't wanna physically twist the cavity, the other thing that you could do is put atoms into your cavity and have them act as a spatially dependent wave plate, right? Uh, and this will make what's called an optical flux lattice uh, or, or rather, in this case, it's the inverse of Nigel Cooper's optical flux lattice. You use the atoms to make a band structure for the light where the burnt bands have a churn number, right? And so you can do this for the optical photons. For the microwave photons, actually, we just introduce ferry magnets into the system. But the point is that always you have to introduce additional degrees of freedom that change the dimensionality if you want to change the physics. That, that's that's been my perspective anyway. Okay, cool. Yeah, thank you. Good. Um, yeah, anyway, it's uh, it's really been a pleasure.